This podcast, including any related materials, such as show notes, links, and supportive materials, is provided by Metagenics Institute, the educational arm of Metagenics, Inc., for general informational and educational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute medical advice and should not be considered a substitute for discussions between individuals and their healthcare providers. The podcast presenters' views are entirely their own and do not represent the views of Metagenics Institute, Metagenics, or any of their research partners and collaborators, collectively referred to as affiliates. Metagenics Institute and its affiliates do not endorse or recommend any specific healthcare providers, products, or other items or services that may be discussed or mentioned in this podcast. Podcast participants may receive compensation from Metagenics Institute and or its affiliates. Metagenics products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. No one needs to tell you how disrupted life can be when your hormones are out of balance. The hundreds of millions spent annually on hormone therapy suggests that lots of us are trying to course correct for both vanity and sanity. But Dr. Philomena Trindade has found striking evidence that we should start by examining the levels of one hormone that has nothing to do with our sex hormone balance. The importance of insulin has, and its downstream effects on the other hormones has really been downplayed and not really understood, right? And the, f- the first time that I really understood is when I looked at the fact that women with more menopausal symptoms have higher rates of cardiovascular disease. Learn what Dr. Trindade has found about the role of insulin in relation to balancing sex hormones, reducing inflammation, and tackling anxiety. Conventional medicine tends to look at insulin in regard to blood sugar levels and their relationship to weight management and also prevention of diabetes. But Dr. Trindade's research and its practical applications in her thriving practice invite us all to take a deeper look at insulin levels and what we can do to manage them naturally so that we can trade anxiety for a more grounded experience of daily life. Join me on this episode of The Practice to learn what Dr. Philomena Trindade has found that gives us an advantage in fighting inflammation, balancing hormones, and developing a robust gut microbiome that can reduce anxiety and support our overall health. Dr. Trindade, when it comes to conventional treatment of anxiety, I just want to hear a little bit about your training, Um, because I I feel like the way I was taught to deal with anxiety is completely different from how I approach it now. Mm -hmm. So what were you taught when you went through medical school and through family practice residency in your training? Basically that, you know, anxiety is really a mental health disease and that needs a prescription and not even so much as you know behavioral therapies I mean that was sort of pushed under the rug really Mm -hmm. and it was more about the pharmacology and the pharmaceuticals which you know in my mind even back then it was like this is there's more to it I just didn't have the tools to figure out how to get to the underlying root cause but it just never really made sense to me well this is such a huge issue because I, I I had the same experience so I started my training in 1989 and you know, it was a pill for every ill. Mm -hmm. And so when it came to anxiety, you know, we got a list of risk factors and a list of the questions to ask. And at that time it was, I don't know, DSM four or something. (laughs) And so, and then, and then a pill. And at that time it was benzodiazepines, you know, just to basically mask symptoms, never any consideration of the root cause of why someone is anxious. And then over the years, I've just seen, you know, the SNRIs Mm -hmm. and the use of gabapentin. It's just sort of, you know, the latest generation of pharmaceuticals instead of looking at the root cause. And it's evolved, you know, because now they're even using anti-epileptic drugs, you know, for anxiety. In functional medicine, we often talk about food and how important it is and how food talks to our DNA and that food really can be the best medicine. I just think that that is huge when we're talking about anxiety and how food can contribute or what we've called food that is not necessarily really food can contribute to anxiety disorders. Absolutely. And I I think this point about inflammation is so key because, 
You know, we've always, I was taught when I went through medical school that anxiety was a mental health disorder, that it had nothing to do with the rest of the body. But I think we're really learning about the role of the gut-brain axis. And food is, is really the place we start with the gut-brain axis. Absolutely. And the fact that there are more ways in which the gut communicates with the brain than vice versa, and how food has such an impact on that, on the gut microbiome, for example, not just the permeability, but all and the microbial factors and how they can communicate with the brain. I think that that is just huge. And, and as you said, a part that we were never taught in medical school, or that connection was never made. Well, this is something I see in my patients all the time, that they're eating the wrong foods, they're eating the gluten, they're eating the sugar, They've got this level of inflammation in their body. And then, no surprise, they also have anxiety if they've got a vulnerability toward it. Or it shows up as depression, or it shows up as addiction. So I think all of these things, we really have to march back to the gut-brain axis. And get back to that root cause. You know, exactly why is someone anxious, not anxiety as a diagnosis. I really think anxiety is a symptom. And then we need to figure out why is someone anxious. And really look at all of their history, what have they done so far, and what's going on in their system right now. And even like what drugs have they been on in the past that could have then have a downstream effect of anxiety, as well as what they're ingesting, what they're breathing, what even the thoughts that they're thinking, really. So let's talk about some of those drugs, okay? Because I was just, I was just watching Dan Harris, who's the guy who wrote the book 10% Happier. And he had, he's a news anchor who um, in front of 5 million people had a panic attack. So he was actually doing a story on statins. He had this panic attack, a total meltdown on national TV. And you can Google this, you can watch him on, um, on your laptop. He basically, you know, he's starting the segment, he's gasping for breath. You can see his heart kind of racing, he's sweating. And he abruptly ended the segment that he was doing. But then he, he started to look at, like, what is it that led to this panic attack that I had? He was in his 30s, I believe. And one of the things he realized is that he was in a state of hyperarousal. And then as he starts to unwind afterwards why this happened, he realized, you know, the recreational cocaine that he was using was probably not a good idea. That was definitely leading to hyperarousal. <laughs> but there's other drugs, too, yeah. that can do this. Antibiotics, for one. Do you see that in your practice with antibiotics? Oh, absolutely. And the fact that they can completely wipe out, you know, the gut flora or the good the gut microbiome, basically the protective, you know, flora in the gut, and how that is often not really even considered a, a side effect or a problem in conventional medicine. I think in conventional medicine we, they're getting a little bit better at saying add some probiotics, but after you finish the antibiotics. And I so I see that so often in my patients. Because I'm constantly saying, no, it needs to be at the same time, but just two hours away because you don't want the antibiotic to kill, you know, the gut, my, the good flora that you're trying to put back in. But it is such an issue and such a key point, I think, that dysbiotic flora, flora and what that can cause in terms of anxiety. Yeah, and there's data to show this. There was a, a case series that I saw published, I think, in 2015 showing somewhere around a 17 to 44% increased rate of anxiety after a course of antibiotics, similar rates with depression. And I actually had an experience like this because I had a surgery last year and I had a month of antibiotics. I've never taken antibiotics in my life and I couldn't talk the surgeon out of it. So I was forced to have this month of antibiotics and of course I'm a biohacker. And so I measured my microbiome beforehand and afterwards a month later. I took probiotics within a couple of hours of finishing the last dose, and my diversity dropped 87% in that period of time, wow. which is not surprising, right? Like, even with taking the probiotics, it didn't yes. help that much. And so I think it's so important to realize that our patients are up against this issue with the medications that we sometimes are prescribing, yes. not the cocaine, but the the other things. As a matter of fact, there is a study uh, looking at someone who did a seven-day course of clindamycin and then looking two years later and they had not taken any probiotics and the effects of that seven-day course of clindamycin were still present two years later. It's profound. pretty amazing. Really yeah. profound. Yeah. Especially when you consider that the average person gets multiple doses of antibiotics. Absolutely. So I want to talk about some of the foods that seem to trigger anxiety. You know, certainly gluten dairy, 
sugar. Those are the biggest players that I see. What yeah, about you? Me too. Uh, corn and some patients as well as soy. Um, nightshades can be a problem, but that usually have more of your joint inflammation um, types. Although I have seen you know, some patients where that was crucial when they came to anxiety. Not as often as something like gluten or dairy and corn and soy, though. Well, certainly those those foods, gluten and the gluteomorphins, mm-hmm. the, the dairy and the caseomorphins, those are associated with addiction. And I think that is part of the story as well, that um, you know, there are certain foods that seem to trigger an addictive pattern. I have that personally with sugar. I have, um, genetically, I have very few dopamine receptors because of a couple of genes. We're gonna get into the conversation of nutrigenomics here for a moment. And so I definitely feel when I have sugar that my, my brain lights up like a Christmas tree. And I think many of our patients have that experience, which is why they have the sugar cravings, they indulge them, and then they can't stop. It's very hard to get off of them. Absolutely, and I think one area that's been key in helping patients um, sort of understand that and not um, blame themselves is to say it's really not about you necessarily. It's not It's not a choice per se. This is basically what it's doing to your brain and the way it's communicating, and it's not sort of a blame or a label because so many patients then feel guilty and feel like, oh, I should be able to overcome this, and sometimes it's a little more than that. That's good. It's not you. It's your brain. <laughs> I think those are really good points. It's the effects <laughs> of it on your brain. You know, because really it's about the food. And if you can you know, remove the food, then that is going to change. But there's such um, finger pointing, I feel. Yeah, that's and, true. And the patients feel like, oh, it's all me and there's nothing I can do about it. That It's so important for us to instill hope and patients and really show them, you know, just how amazing the body is in terms of trying to heal itself if you just give it sort of the right precursors. This is such an important point because I think there's this innate intelligence of the body that we want to access. And I I think often if you look at big food in the food industry, they've taken advantage of people like me who tend to be short on dopamine receptors and they design food to be hyper palatable. So it's designed to, to set up that addictive pattern and that you know kind of anxiety that I think women especially feel, and then they satisfy it with food. And so it, it sets up this pattern that I think is re- very difficult to break out of. And it's, um, and as you said, I wanna give people hope too, because when you actually remove that food, when you remove the sugar, when you remove the gluten, when you remove the dairy, it makes such a huge difference in terms of your physiology, like that innate intelligence can finally shine through. And it's not a moral failing, right? It's it's really the way that big food has kind of disenfranchised us from the, the innate intelligence that we have. Yeah, that's such an important point. So what about women? So I imagine you see this in your practice that more women have anxiety than the men in your practice. What is that about? Do you think it's estrogen? Do you think it's the way that we're culturally conditioned? Like, what's, why do we, why are we more anxious? I think it's a little bit of all. Uh, I think first of all, it's partly our hormones. We have more hormones to balance than men. That's we have sure. more hormones more that are working together. <laughs> exactly. It's really all about the symphony and not each necessarily just each individual hormone, although each has to be balanced. But you want to make sure they're all making beautiful music together. You know, whether you're talking about insulin or cortisol or thyroid or the sex hormones, you know, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. If any one of those is unbalanced, that can create anxiety. And we often forget just how important it is to really look at the whole symphony. But I also think that the importance of insulin has, and its downstream effects on the other hormones has really been downplayed and not really understood, right? And the, f- the first time that I really understood is when I looked at the fact that women with more menopausal symptoms have higher rates of cardiovascular disease. Yes. And when you try to find why, well, it's really all about the insulin. It's that many of those symptoms, especially the symptoms of menopause, are really due to the insulin and not necessarily to the estrogen like we've been taught in many cases. Well, I think all roads lead back to insulin, actually. (laughs) I agree. I think that's true in perimenopause. It's true in menopause. It's certainly true with accelerated aging in general for both men and women. It's certainly true for um, cognitive decline. I think Mm -hmm. insulin signaling is probably 60% of the story there. 
So I want to talk about estrogen for a moment because I, you know, I see women over the entire life cycle. And what I especially find right now is that my younger women, so these are the adolescent women, mm -hmm. so like 13 until 26, I'm told that's the upper age of adolescence now, which scares me to death because I still have two kids <laughs> under that age. I see a lot of anxiety in those younger women. And I think I definitely see an uptick around the time of menarche. Mm -hmm. So when women start to cycle and they have more estrogen on board, I definitely see more anxiety. I mean, there's also the role of the smartphones and the, mm -hmm. the social media and all these other influences or scary news cycle. Um, but I'm curious if you see that too. Oh, absolutely. Just like I see a lot more PMS, premenstrual syndrome, and PCOS, which we know with respect to premenstrual syndrome, it's very much tied to imbalances in, in the hormones, and especially low progesterone. With PCOS, we're talking more about insulin and insulin resistance. But I'm seeing so much more of that in younger women, and I really think it's that everything we're doing is we're really making that cortisol diversion, or what used to be called the prenatal steel or the cortisol steel, where progesterone being an upstream hormone is being diverted to the glucocorticoids to the cortisol and so they're anxious because their progesterone is low because they're losing their progesterone because they're spending so much yes. time in this sort of sympathetic dominant state uh, where their hpa axis is just you know upregulated and they're kind of in this hypersensitivity <laughs> mode yes like that yeah yeah so overdrive i think that's mm -hmm. such an important player here and that you know that that idea that you're just making cortisol, cortisol, cortisol at the expense of your other sex hormones, especially progesterone. And I think of progesterone as like nature's benzodiazepine, right? So like true. it calms yeah. us down. It helps us sleep at night. Yeah, it helps, exactly. you know, it's it's the, the counterpart, the tango partner to mm -hmm. estrogen. And we need estrogen and progesterone to have this beautiful dance Absolutely. in order to feel calm and to feel nurtured and like we can you know, fulfill our biological imperatives. And then I, I also, I see an uptick in anxiety in perimenopause. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've got a woman right now who's um, 48 years young. She didn't have a period for about five months. And for the first time in her life, she started to feel anxious, you know, not full on panic attacks, but, you know, waking up and ruminating mm -hmm. at four o'clock in the morning. You know, just having kind of like, like this cold sweat that would just take over for no good reason. And, um, you know, I have, I have a functional medicine protocol that I use on my patients with anxiety, but sometimes you want to help them feel better as fast as possible in parallel mm -hmm. with doing your assessment of the rest of the functional medicine um, workup. And so I started her on some estrogen because I find that that's very helpful along with progesterone to help her sleep because she hadn't slept in so long. And right away she started to feel better. And I, you know, that's not always the case. I think there's, you know, for the most part with estrogen treatment, um, there's mixed data because it looks like the estrogen receptors have differential effects on anxiety. Like the ER alpha mm -hmm. is anxiogenic. ER beta is anxiolytic. The newer estrogen receptors have kind of mixed data. Um, and so sometimes I throw in a little Siberian ginseng to try to activate the ER beta. But I'm wondering how you approach this. How do you deal with perimenopause? Well, I have a protocol too. And my protocol is balance insulin first, yeah. then address the HPA axis, then thyroid, and then the sex hormones. Because in many cases, by the time you get to the sex hormones, they're already balanced. But I see a lot of insulin resistance, particularly in the perimenopause. I'm seeing it in younger and younger women, you know, as well too. But I think it's so important to really look at that and also to look at how are they breaking down their hormones, particularly their estrogen. Because in the perimenopause, sometimes what you have is you have an estrogen dominance and insufficient progesterone. And if they have a single nucleotide polymorphism and their ability to break down estrogen, either in phase one or phase two or both, what I call my double whammies and triple whammies, then they really are not able to. So they're in this estrogen dominant state. They don't have sufficient progesterone and you know they can be highly anxious and not able to break it down. Then their catecholamines are up. They can't break them down either, especially if this catecholamethyltransferase is a problem. And so it becomes like this vicious cycle, and it's really hard to get them to actually, you know, calm down and get back to sleeping and doing the things that they need to. But one thing I wanted to get back to is that you see a lot more women presenting 
you know, with anxiety in, in the perimenopause, and how in the sort of traditional model, what would, what would happen to that person? Well, they would be given a prescription. Mm -hmm. I have a patient who was just that, exactly that. She presented with lots of anxiety, got diagnosed with bipolar disorder, was put on two different SSRIs and an anxiolytic, and then was like, this is not helping me. I'm not any better. What do I do? And was really sort of questioning her whole existence, to be perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until we had to get to the root cause and figure out, okay, let's look at your hormones. Let's look at insulin. Let's look at the adrenals. Let's look at thyroid. What's going on with the whole HPA axis? And and as well as your sex hormones to really try and figure out what are those underlying root causes. And I have this rule. If a patient comes to me on a prescription that I didn't prescribe, I usually don't take them off that prescription without consulting that doctor. And, you know, we have colleagues that will want to work with us, and we have some that don't. Right. <laughs> In this case, I just basically started with, you know, what she was eating, the thoughts she was thinking, what she was doing for exercise, for recreation. You know, did she have an aha in her life? What did she do? What can she do that actually makes her feel good about who she is? And, and then balanced her hormones, and she actually started decreasing the SSRIs. First, it was the anxiolytics to go away. Yes. And then the antidepressants. And the most amazing thing is one day she came in and she told me, I am off all prescription drugs, and I feel great, wow. and I am sleeping well. Amazing. So that's a huge win. And I, I feel like, you know, ultimately, whether you're allopathic or you practice functional medicine, what we want is for our patients to win. So I think that's a success all the way around. I wanted to ask you more specifically about how you assess, say you have a 48-year-old who's um, anxious. How do you assess the insulin pathway? Do you do fasting insulin? Do you track? Do you stick a two-week continuous glucose monitor in their arm? <laughs> do you do a two-hour GTT? Like, what do you do to collect your data? Well, this is a, something I've struggled with for years because I'm known in my area as being too strict when it comes to sugar and insulin. And well, I don't know about that. I'm only a few miles north of you, so <laughs> I'm pretty strict too. <laughs> so we're both strict. Yes, exactly. And we probably, you know, really complement each other really well. So um, I really like starting with looking at adiponectin, mm -hmm. but also looking at fasting insulin, mm -hmm. looking at postprandial insulin, um, looking at hemoglobin A1C, and I do a postprandial insulin after more, more or less a 75 gram glucose load, but I look at insulin and glucose at half hour, an hour, and two hours, because there are some women or some people that can increase their insulin level or their glucose at the half hour, and by the time you do it at one hour, you may not see it. The sneaky ones. Yes, yeah. and, and there was, you know, David Ludwig has written about that, not too many other people have. But I really am looking to see, you know, how much pancreatic beta cell function yes. do we have or how much damage have we done and how can we reverse it because it is reversible as i always say the pancreatic beta cell does forgive <laughs> but i really <laughs> wish we had more earlier markers adiponectin is a really good marker right? it's a it decreases before insulin increases except in a subgroup of patients where we don't know why their adiponectin may not decrease because I'm always looking for the earlier marker, the better. Mm -hmm. And one area that I feel like there hasn't been much focus, but I think is really important, is looking at the postprandial insulin. Because you can have a completely normal fasting insulin, and you may even have a normal hemoglobin A1C, but the moment you challenge the pancreas, or the moment you challenge that patient with a high glucose load, their postprandial insulin goes up. And that's usually what you see going up first. And so I think we're missing some of those patients by just looking at the hemoglobin A1C and, the, and even a fasting insulin. We really need to also look at postprandial. That's one of my pet peeves. I, I totally agree with that, and I see that in my practice as well. So let's talk about addiction. I feel like there's a story there in terms of anxiety, and I'm just curious about how addiction shows up in your practice. What sort of things do you see? You know, heart addiction, soft addiction, process addictions. What are you seeing, and how does anxiety play a role? Well, I think I'm seeing more and more addictions in general, but not necessarily sort of your hardcore addictions or your to illicit drugs. I see it um, 
in terms of addiction to even over-the-counter things, whether it's anti-ulcer medications or um, your Advils, for example, or your non anti-inflammatories, so that people are trying to self-medicate their anxiety and they're just reaching for whatever's possible because anxiety will manifest differently in different people. So in some, they may suffer from reflux or dyspepsia, and so they're going to reach for that anti-ulcerant or that proton pump inhibitor to try and mask those symptoms. It's really all a matter of, you know, how is it being manifested? How is anxiety manifesting in that particular person? So they can be addicted to food. There are behaviors as well. It's all of whatever sort of calms their, or they feel like calms their nervous system in a way. Well, another thing that I see that you just made me think of is the number of people that I see who are addicted to exercise. So they use exercise to kind of deal with the stresses in their life, mm-hmm. they use it to treat their anxiety, but there's an unhealthy edge to it. You know, certainly I don't want to discourage anyone from exercise, right. but what I see is these patients who are going to a double soul cycle class, or they're going to, um, you know, they're going to two bar classes in a row, and they have a stress fracture on their foot, and they're still running on their foot, right? I, it seems like you're laughing because you see it's, this yes. too. Well, I was laughing because I take two bar classes a day. <laughs> oh, and I okay. Thinking, Uh-oh. You're very fit. <laughs> Not every day. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes it's like it's the exercise for the amount of stress or, or what you're yes. under. It's like you're matching the stress. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and when is it relaxing and really calm you down? And when really is it just perpetuating, you know, the cycle? Yes. that you're on because I see it so much in my perimenopausal women who all of a sudden decide to run right. a marathon. Right, right. And it's, it's like the worst time in the sense in their life to do that. And not that exercise isn't good, but it's in moderation and for what's going on with their HPA axis and, and their life in general. But I, that's a big one and an extremely important one to, to discuss, I think. Well, it's huge. And I, I think often when you see an athlete who's taking a lot of um, ibuprofen, for example, it's because of that stress fracture that's not healing. So they have this pain. You know, pain is often a message from the body that there's an imbalance somewhere. And so instead of treating it with a drug, you know, it it goes back to Sidney Baker with Mm -hmm. the idea of, you know, if you're sitting on a tack, don't take ibuprofen. Like, take the tack out. Get to the root cause and address that. So... You know, that's one of the addictive patterns I see. Another one that I see that is huge, and I'm curious if you see this too, is I see more and more women drinking more and more alcohol as a way of coping with stress. And, you know, kind of the irony is that the very thing you think you're getting from alcohol is actually robbing from you. So it's raising your cortisol the next day. It's giving you anxiety symptoms the next day as you withdraw from Mm -hmm. it. And especially, you know, women over the age of 40 who are less able to process the alcohol in their liver compared to when they were in their 20s or 30s. Mm-hmm. So you see that too? Oh yeah, a lot. And it's it's also you know, sort of disorganizing their methylation pathways, Absolutely. right? It's decreasing their ability to methylate. And it's really funny when I ask them, how much alcohol do you think a woman can have? I usually hear, oh, one glass of wine a day. And I'm like, no, less than a half a glass, <laughs> I'd say. Period. And I think it's in some women, it's none at all. It's all a matter of where they're at. And the fact that in many cases, they're doing it to mask symptoms, right? Yes. They're doing it to try and relax or sleep. But really, they're getting stuck in that vicious cycle where they can't sleep. And then the next day, just like you said, they're going to be less able to make their neurotransmitters and less able to really cope. But it becomes like such a habit that it's very difficult for them to break. I, I've seen women have a very hard time with this. Huge. So they wake up in the morning after having their two glasses of wine. Maybe they shared a bottle with their mm-hmm. husband the day before. And then their cortisol's higher. So they, they feel kind of revved up. And then they have a couple cups of coffee. Okay. So then their cortisol's even higher. And then they start to feel anxious as, you know, all of this is kind of working through their matrix. And then they're trying to transition at the end of the day to calm down from all of that stress. And so they reach for a bottle of wine again. And you and I live in the Bay Area, so we especially see this with our proximity to Napa Valley. So I feel like this is such a huge issue. And, you know, what I, this is probably my least popular message. I tell patients, listen, more than two glasses of wine a week, more than two servings of alcohol is associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. So you have a choice here in terms of your risk of breast cancer, which, you know, our lifetime risk is 12.5%. It's pretty high. So 
I think we're drinking way too much yeah. and we're self-medicating anxiety. And I actually have some patients where that's a social thing they do with their husband. And when yes. I cut back on their alcohol, they get, they not just they get upset, their husbands right. get very upset. I have some tips. <laughs> oh yeah, you want to, so here are my, my date night ideas when you start to drink less. So you take a sauna together. Mm, nice. <laughs> Do you like that? Yeah, I love that. <laughs> so you make an amazing meal. You go to a farmer's market. You make an amazing meal together, and there's no alcohol. You have fizzy water. You have filtered water, my favorite. I like long walks. Mm -hmm. I just got a new dog, and so oh. I'm, like, obsessed with walking my dog with my husband. And honestly... You know, the going out to a restaurant, sharing a bottle of wine that we used to do through my 30s. I just, my body can't cope with that. It's not good for me. And, you know, going back to the innate intelligence of the body, I can't activate the innate intelligence of this body mm -hmm. with half a bottle of wine. It's just not going to happen. Because it does affect our methylation pathways. And we don't often think about how important methylation and glutathione are, are in terms of breast cancer risk and estrogen metabolism. I feel like that's one area where conventional medicine really has not addressed it at all, even though it's in the literature. I mean, we have great studies on how by um, someone or improving or optimizing someone's methylation pathways as well as their glutathione conjugation pathways, you can actually decrease their risk for hormone-related cancers in both men and women, and but in women, particularly breast cancer and prostate cancer in men. And methylation is such an important part of that. Um, and of course, you're decreasing your ability to methylate when you ingest more alcohol. So there's just so much downstream effects from that. We understand that alcohol raises some of the bad estrogens, but I, I also wonder about the role of alcohol on methylation and how much, you know, what's what's the relative contribution, methylation versus estrogen, um, and how it's getting metabolized. And I, I feel like, you know, in conventional medicine, they have an understanding of so much of the basic science of breast cancer. They understand that, mm -hmm. you know, BRCA1 and BRCA2, these tumor suppressor genes, even CHECK2, methylation is what controls them. Exactly. And yet, in conventional medicine, when you go, if you're a high-risk person with breast cancer, you never hear the word mm -hmm. methylate when you go see your oncologist or when you get counseling about what to do. They are more likely to recommend a prophylactic mastectomy or oophorectomy mm -hmm. than to talk to you about methylation, exactly. which is a crime. Yeah. Or even just how your important nutrition is. I have a patient who's right now um, undergoing chemotherapy and uh, for breast cancer. And I was talking to her about the importance of her diet. And her question to me was, why isn't my oncologist telling me about this? You know, it, it's really a disservice that we're doing. It is a women. disservice. I mean, I feel like that's slowly changing, right? I mean, you and I both There's... trained as allopathic physicians, and I don't want to throw them under the bus. No. But um, I just went to a fasting conference where there were a few oncologists who were talking about the 5-2 diet, and we're talking about the fasting mimicking diet and its role in making tumors more sensitive to chemotherapy. So we're starting to make some inroads. Thank goodness for functional medicine, right? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for being with us for this episode of The Practice. You'll find extensive show notes, including links and supportive materials over at thepracticepodcast.tv. While you're there, explore other topics and use the Ask and Answer button to ask your burning questions and give your insights about the topic. After all, the future of medicine lies in dialogue, not dogma. Let's transform medicine together by connecting on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You'll find all the links at thepracticepodcast.tv. This podcast, including any related materials such as show notes, links, and supportive materials, is provided by Metagenics Institute, the educational arm of Metagenics, Inc., for general informational and educational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute medical advice and should not be considered a substitute for discussions between individuals and their healthcare providers. This podcast does not create a doctor-patient relationship and should not be considered a substitute for the independent professional judgment of any physician or healthcare professional regarding the appropriate course of action for a particular patient or individual. Metagenics does not make any guarantees regarding the accuracy, completeness, or usefulness of this podcast for any particular purpose. Listeners may use this podcast at their own risk and patients should not disregard or delay seeking advice from their healthcare providers based on the content of this podcast.
Participation through the Ask and Answer button is optional, and no participant should feel obligated to provide personal details, including about any diagnosis, symptoms, or other health-related information. Neither Metagenics Institute nor any of its affiliates seek this information, and it is not necessary to participate in the dialogue regarding this podcast. The podcast presenter's views are entirely their own and do not represent the views of Metagenics Institute, Metagenics, or any of its research partners and collaborators, collectively referred to as affiliates. Metagenics Institute and its affiliates do not endorse or recommend any specific healthcare providers, products, or other items or services that may be discussed or mentioned in this podcast. Podcast participants may receive compensation from Metagenics Institute and or its affiliates. Listening to this podcast does not obligate you to purchase, use, recommend, or prescribe any Metagenics or Metagenics Institute products or services, including their educational materials. Metagenics products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Unless approved by Metagenics Institute, this podcast must be used only for personal, non-commercial purposes. This podcast has no independent economic value and is intended to comply with all applicable laws. It may be rescinded, revoked, or amended at any time without notice. Listeners who are patients should talk to their healthcare providers if they have any questions regarding the content discussed in this podcast. Listeners who are healthcare professionals may obtain more information by visiting metagenicsinstitute.com, calling 888 888- 690-8500 or emailing med ed at metagenicsinstitute.com.